We all have moments, some severe and unforgettable. We're in a situation you say, will I make it through? Or maybe you say, I don't think I'm going to make it through. It can be, it can be as severe as this story, which we're going to hear the rest of the story in the next couple of weeks. We all hit those moments in life where, where we just say, I, I don't know if I can make it from here to there. It, it may be going to the mailbox and getting a legal document where the person who said, I do, is now saying, I don't. And the one who said, till death do us part, said, I'm done. And you hit this point where you just said, this is not the world and the life I envisioned. I don't, how, how am I going to push on? How am I going to make it through? It could come uh, at a doctor's office when the doctor comes in with a real somber look on their face and they give you the news. And in a moment, your whole life changes and your whole future changes. And you, and you just say, how do I get through this? How do, I, how do I walk through this? How do I live through this? It could be a situation where you come to work in the morning thinking everything's fine, and before the end of the day, they've explained that we've restructured, and in our restructure, your position doesn't exist anymore, which is a way of saying we don't need you anymore. And your whole world just changes, and you say, how, how am I going to get through this? How am I going to make it through this? It comes in lots of shapes and lots of forms. But there's always those moments in life where we say, how do I make it through this? And for the next six weeks, we're going to talk about, about the spiritual reality that God wants you to know that if you know the God of heaven and if you know his son, Jesus Christ, you will get through this, whatever your this is. In this life or beyond, in some way, God will bring you through. God will take you through. And we're going to meet a man named Joseph. In the Old Testament, in Genesis, you have the patriarchs of the faith, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Jacob has all these kids, all these boys. And Joseph, at this point, is the youngest when we meet him. And he walks on this journey where, where he had to have said a hundred times, how will I ever make it through this? Will I get through this? And yet, God led him. God guided him. God walked with him through it all. And some of you sitting here may have been told somewhere along the line by a pastor or preacher, or maybe you got the idea from some book you read or somebody you listened to on TV, you got this idea that if you become a follower of God and you put your faith in Jesus, then, then, then from that moment on, things will go your way. Life will, life will be smooth sailing and life will be relatively easy and there might be a few little bumps on the road, but pretty much you're heading off towards a happy future without a lot of struggle. Somebody may have told you that if you really love God and love Jesus, that's how life will be. The problem is anybody who told you that hasn't read this book or they haven't read it very closely because this book tells us that if we know God and love Jesus, there will still be challenges. There will be moments that are difficult. There'll be pain and there'll be loss. The question is not, will there be tough times? The question is, will you know what it means to walk with God through those times? In the book of 1 Peter, Peter was one of Jesus' closest friends and inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. In 1 Peter chapter 4, Beginning of verse 12, he writes these words. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But, and here's a strange word, but rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is to be revealed. There's something that happens when you walk with God, when you have your faith in Jesus, somehow the most painful, difficult circumstances can be turned around and used for good. And some of the hard things we face in life, we have nothing to do with. It's just we're in a broken world. Sometimes the hard things we experience is because a broken person, a sinful person, makes a bad decision and it hurts us. Sometimes the things that we face are because we make really dumb choices and we reap what we sow by the choices we've made. And sometimes, in hard times, we walk into those things, and it wasn't that somebody else did something, it wasn't that we did something, it, it just, we don't understand what's going on, but we look and say, this is difficult, and I'm here, and I don't know how I'm going to make it through, and in some cases, until we're on the other side of it, and we can look back, 
It may be a long time we understand how and why we even made it through and what happened there. But there will be times where we come to the other side and we will see God's hand in some way leading us through something we did not understand at all. The question is not, you know, if there'll be tough times. There will be. As a matter of fact, uh, God has told us there'll be trials and challenges along the way. If someone's told you that isn't true, again, they're working out of a different book than the Bible. In James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, we read these words. James says, consider it, and again, strange words, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. I mean, if you have your Bible open, just put your finger there for a minute and pause. I mean, maybe you've been around the church a lot, you've heard a lot of Bible stuff, and you can read that, and it doesn't freak you out. But this should, this should cause you to stop and go, what? I mean, it says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. What? How can that be? And yet it says this, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. There is a mysterious work of God that can happen in us when we walk through the hard times. A maturity that comes, a perseverance that comes, a transformed heart that comes when we walk with God through the storms and the loss and the pain and the hurt. Whether it came from someone else, from ourselves, or God's doing a mysterious work behind the scenes, we often won't know. But there is always something God can do in us. And so I want to pause as we start the six-week journey of walking with Joseph. As we walk through his story and as we let it reflect on our story. And I want to pause and just pray for God to speak to us because for many people sitting here right now, you are in the middle of a storm right now. You're in the middle of a tough time or you're walking with someone who is right in the middle of it. Have you ever noticed that when you walk closely with someone who's in the middle of a storm, you experience a lot of the storm too because you walk with them through it? And for most of us, we're either coming out of a tough time, in the middle of a tough time, or somewhere on the horizon, <laughs> something's coming. And you say, well, that's kind of morbid. That's just true. We live in a broken world. And I love those great seasons where things are going great and we have strength to help others going through a tough time. But we're either going through something tough or we're walking with somebody who is and God wants to speak to us. Let's pray and talk to him about this. Oh God, as we begin this six-week journey walking with Joseph, this unique young man who at 17 had his life turned upside down and for two decades went through hardship and pain and struggle. Lord, I pray that as we walk this journey over these six weeks, you will speak to our hearts. You'll meet us where we are. You'll show us your face in the middle of the storm. And you'll teach us what it means to walk with you in power and in strength, even in the tough times. Speak to us and teach us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, for the last four years, uh, my wife Sherry and I have had the privilege and the opportunity to work, uh, do writing and work with a man named Max Lucado. You may have heard of him, you may not have. He's a pastor in Texas, great writer, great pastor, and he writes a lot of wonderful books. And we've worked on numerous projects, and we worked on this project called You'll Get Through This, about the life of Joseph. And as we were working on it, I just kind of, as we were working, I just kept feeling like we need to spend time on this topic with Shoreline Church. He, he actually wrote this, this wonderful book, You'll Get Through This, and it's all about the life of Joseph. And so I'm telling you on the front side over these six weeks, for myself and the others that are preaching, we're, we've learned from Max, we've learned some things he shared, and so I'm gonna share some things I've learned from him. I, uh, Solomon said thousands of years ago, there's nothing new under the sun. I'm not terribly creative, I learned from lots of people, so I wanna put on the front burner there that you know I've learned a lot from Max and his writing on this, and we're gonna look at a lot of things that'll speak to our hearts and our lives. And I wanna begin our journey of learning about Joseph, just kind of giving you an overview of some of the things we're gonna learn over these six weeks, some of the, the big epic themes we're gonna see. First, we learn in this story, the story of Joseph, that is filled with surprises and struggles. If you'll, if you'll follow along with us and read the story of Joseph, if you do the weekly reading in, the in our bulletins and on our website, seven days a week, there's a daily reading. If you follow that reading over the next six weeks, you'll read Joseph's entire story three times. You'll, every two weeks, you'll read his story. Every two weeks, you'll, and, you'll, and you'll really learn a lot from God's word. I encourage you to do that, to follow along. It's, it's probably about 10 minutes of reading a day but you'll get the whole story. It's in their bulletin. It's on the website. And we'll learn lots of things. It's filled with surprises and struggles. As you read the story, you'll see those things, things that twist and turns you didn't see coming, and struggle and pain and heartache along the way. A second thing you'll learn is this, that God was present every step of the way. When you read Joseph's story, 
You're going to hear this line again and again and again. But the Lord was with Joseph. He gets thrown in jail unjustly. But the Lord was with Joseph. He becomes a slave. He's sold into slavery. But the Lord was with Joseph. People who promised to help him ignored him when things went well for them. But the Lord was with Joseph. And what we're going to learn is that when we go through our tough times, the Lord is with us too. So we're going to walk Joseph's story. Surprises, struggles, God was present every step of the way. His family was not perfect and neither was Joseph. Some people try to paint Joseph as this perfect guy. We meet him when he's 17. When's the last time you had a perfect 17-year-old? Exactly, point made. Uh, he wasn't perfect, and neither was his family. Pastor Roy is going to do one of the messages in the series, and he's going to talk about the, that family dynamic. Pastor Roy is our family life minister, our family life pastor here at Shoreline, and he's going to do a message on kind of Joseph's family and how God t- teaches us through that experience. A fourth thing is this. It was not a week-long storm. It was a 20-year hurricane. We'll meet Joseph at 17. And at the end of his story where it finishes, we start in Genesis 30, uh, 37, we finish in Genesis 50. And over 20 years have gone by. We like little storms that come, a couple days, eye of the storm, little break, a couple more tough days, and we're through it. Doesn't always go that way. 20-year hurricane of pain and loss and struggle. But on the other side of it, he was able to look back and see how God had been at work. And also, through it all, God was on the throne and in control. God proved himself sovereign. We don't use that word sovereign a lot anymore. It's a great word. It's a word that describes the presence and the power of God, the God who rules, who reigns, who's writing the story, even when we don't don't understand the script of it. A God who is truly on the throne. And in Joseph's life, we see that even when it didn't make sense and when he couldn't see it, God was still present. And you need to learn that in these six weeks. No matter how bad the storm gets, no matter how painful it might be, God is still on the throne. God is present. God is powerful. And there's this little line uh, that Max Lucado uses through his, dis- his study of this book that I loved. And his line goes something, I, I changed it a little bit, but it goes something like this. You'll get through this. It won't be easy. It won't be quick. But you are not alone. And God is on the throne. It might be a good thing to be able to begin to say, you know, I'll get through this. It may not be easy. It may not be quick. But I will never be alone because God is on the throne. And if we can get that truth in our souls, it will speak to us. And we'll learn all kinds of things. Well, I want to begin. If you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis 37 with me. If you don't, you can, I'd encourage you these next five weeks, bring a Bible with you. If you don't have a Bible, go by our Connection Center and say, hey, I'd love to have a Shoreline Bible. They'll give you a Bible, all right? We want to make sure everyone has a Bible. But you'll want to keep some notes in your Bible on Genesis 37 to 50 as we walk through this over six weeks. And so it'd be good to bring your Bible along and kind of follow along with us. I want you to meet Joseph. We're going to look at Genesis 37. We're going to begin in verse 2. And I want to walk through this and kind of think through this story that's unfolding. Remember, you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs of the faith, and Joseph's one of Jacob's kids. He's number 12, youngest of 12 boys. We begin in verse 2. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Pause button. His father's wives, there were four wives involved. Interesting storyline. Not preaching on that in this series, and so you can do your own research on that. Different time, different world, different place. Uh, But but that becomes part of the family conflict. But here's the key thing. He brought their father a bad report about them. The youngest of 12 boys goes scurrying off to dad and gives a bad report about the older boys, which makes you very popular with your big brothers, right? (laughs) There's conflict brewing here, and we can see it. Verse 3, and we see where the conflict's coming from also. Now Israel, that's a nickname for for Jacob, his father. Now Joseph's father, Israel, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made an ornate robe for him. Hit the pause button there. This is not a series on parenting, but it's always a bad idea to favor one kid above the others. And if you do, don't let the others know. No, that's not the point at all. It's always a bad thing because you know what? They can see it. They can feel it. They can taste it in the air. Be so careful about this. Verse four, when his brothers saw that their father loved Joseph more than any of them, listen to this, they hated him 
and could not speak a kind word to him. Conflict in the family. Joseph, the youngest of 12, hated by his 11 older brothers because he was favored. He had the fancy robe and they had plain burlap, burlap sacks. He got the new clothes, they had hand-me-downs kind of a thing. I mean, he was favored and everyone knew it. And, and this, this fancy robe was sort of a sign of his, dad's, of his dad's favoritism towards him. And, and so we begin to see the, the family dynamics. They couldn't speak a kind word to him. Verse five, Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. Now, you may not be a dream specialist. You may not have a, a gift for interpreting dreams. But I want you to listen to this dream and tell me if you can figure it out, okay? It's not very complicated. And Joseph's only 17, so maybe he didn't quite get it. But you can figure that older brothers that are already angry at you and bitter towards you probably don't need to hear this particular dream. See, if, okay, dream interpretation 101. You ready? See if you can figure this out. Here we go. He told them the dream. They hated him all the more. Why? Here's his dream. Joseph said to his brothers, listen to this dream I had. We, me and my brothers, we were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. <laughs> Veiled, fuzzy, hard to figure that one out, right? I mean, it's pretty, it seems pretty obvious, right? They gather around mine, they bow down to it. Look at the response in verse eight. His brothers said to him, I mean, they got it right away. Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Now the bitterness goes deeper and the conflict becomes greater. Verse nine, then he had another dream. At this point, will he decide, maybe I shouldn't go talking about the dream? No, absolutely not. He had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. Can you see him just roll their eyes? Like, oh man, we gotta hear another one of his dreams, right? This time, now see if you can interpret this one. The sun and the moon and 11 stars. How many brothers does he have? 11. The sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. And may want to work at, just take a shot at interpreting that one, right? When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him. He got the message. And he said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept this matter in mind. So, so the story unfolds. And, and I, I see at least three things in this part of the passage. Here's the first thing. A young man's dreams and mouth. Now, he had these two dreams. Let me, I'll, I'll, I'll be a spoiler alert here. The dreams come true. The dreams were from God. But... He lays them out on his brothers, and it doesn't go real well. He does it twice. So, so there's the dreams, then there's the mouth. It may not have been the wisest thing to be telling his brothers about the dreams, but, but again, somehow in the midst of this mess, God's in it. A second thing we see here is a dad's favoritism. The dad set up a very bad situation in the family by favoring this one. And the others could see it. And the, the bitterness and the envy was seething. And then you see finally the brothers' envy, jealousy, and hatred. The seeds of envy aren't just seeds now. They've grown. They've blossomed. And there's this life of bitterness toward, they can't even speak one kind word to little brother Joseph. So what, what happens now is, is that that story unfolds and this bitterness is seething. And I, I wanna hit the pause button there and I wanna give you a, a historical understanding. I'm gonna talk about, about Joseph being thrown into a cistern. And if you, don't, you probably don't have a cistern around your neighborhood or in your yard, I wanna give you a little background here. You see a picture up here of a couple of cisterns. A cistern would be a hole in the ground that had been dug out or, or naturally made that would be this sort of large cavern, not in sand, but in stone. Because what would happen in that part of the world, there would be wells, if they could dig deep enough and get some water to percolate up, they could draw water that way. But a cistern was just this big, massive hole in the ground with a small opening, and they would actually, if they would make cisterns, they would do it in an area where there would be a natural wash of water, because it almost never rained there, but when it rained, it would rain hard, and the ground was so hard, it would just become almost like a flood. And if you could get a cistern in a floodplain, what would happen is in about five or ten minutes, the whole thing would fill up with water. And then for months, you could draw water out of there. So, so that's what a cistern is, and that's going to come into play as, as we continue uh, the story. But, but really, for, for our purposes, uh, we discover in a moment that Joseph is thrown into a cistern. He's put into this place. And, and here's the reality, the spiritual reality. We will all spend time in cisterns. They're a dark pit in the ground. We'll do this in the journey of life. And the real question is not if, but how. 
The question is not if you will end up in a cistern, in a pit in the ground, in a, in a place that's dark where you can't get out and all you can just look up and see a little bit of light and maybe sometimes not see any light at all. Joseph, in a moment, we're gonna read about him being thrown in a cistern. This will happen to you, it will happen to me. The question is not if, the question is how will I live through that time? Who will I be when I'm in a cistern? How will I live my life? Will I hold on to God? Will I hold on to my faith? Will I know that God is present and sovereign? Or will I give up? And to go through it, we have to make a decision in how we're gonna walk through these times. So we're gonna continue our story in Genesis 37. Joseph ends up being thrown in a cistern, then he's, then he's sold into slavery. So look with me at chapter 37, verse 18. Chapter 37, verse 18. What's happened now is Joseph's father has said, Joseph's at home with dad and mom. All the other, guys, all the other boys are out working in the fields. They're traveling with the, the herds, they're, the flocks. They're feeding, going from town to town, trying to find good ground and good, you know, good um, feed for them. So they're traveling and traveling. They're quite a ways from home. So Joseph is sent to check in and see how they're doing. He goes from place to place. He keeps, well, they, they went over here, they went over there, and he's following their trail. And finally, he sees the flocks, and he sees his brother in the distance and he's walking towards them. They see him and recognize him a long way away. Why can they recognize him a long way away? He's got he's Mr. Fancy, Mr. Fancy coat, you know, and he's wearing it. And you can wear a coat, then you can wear a coat. And I think he's wearing it and wearing it. Um, and so verse 18, but they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Now, this doesn't come out of nowhere. There's the father's favoritism. There's the dreams and the interpretations. There's his bad report. But, but I suspect, because as human nature works, they see him in a distance. They see him coming. They start talking about him. They wouldn't talk to him, but you know they were talking about him. Yeah, Joseph and his dreams, and Joseph is always the one ratting on, uh, on us to dad. And, and, you know, and one of them says, you know what we ought to do when he gets here? We ought to just kill him. Kind of half kidding and testing the waters. And somebody else probably said, it's not a bad idea. I mean, we're a long ways from home. Dad would never, nobody would ever know as long as we agree. And somehow from the time they see him in the distance to the time he shows up, they have decided as a group, they're gonna kill their brother. I mean, this is bitterness. This is anger. This is hatred. They said they're gonna kill him. So he shows up and this is where we continue on. They say in verse 19, here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. I mean, no, no answer to those dreams because he'll be gone. And they make this decision. We're going to kill him. We're going to take his fancy robe. We'll just kill an animal, put some blood on it. There's no DNA testing back in the ancient world. We'll just show, and there's, we'll just show the robe to dad and we'll say, dad, uh, we're not sure. We don't recognize it. Is this Joseph's robe? We can't tell, you know. There's so many robes like this around. Uh, but you know, dad, and, and dad will see the blood all over it. He'll think a wild animal killed him. And we're done with our brother. I, I mean, it, it's, it's a heart-rending, sad story. We pick it up in verse 23. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe. First thing, they stripped off the robe. They hated that robe. They hated him. The ornate robe he was wearing. And they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty, thud. He lands in the bottom of it. No water in it. And then they sat down to eat a meal. Almost no conscious about it at all. They throw him in this cistern. They leave him there to die. It's over. It's done. And, and, and so, so at this point, we look at the story and, and we find out that he's, uh, he's been thrown in this cistern. Shortly, we're gonna find out this, the story continues on. Uh, but uh, he, here he is, and, and the Bible tells us later on that because the story doesn't end here, it'd be a short series. Um, the Bible tells us later on that his brothers remembered how he cried for help and begged them not to do this. And they ignored him. And so then what happens is this caravan, they see this caravan coming, and it's traders, they're trading in spices and in different, different things, and in people, in slaves, and they see him coming. And Judah, one of the brothers, uh, has, has this brilliant idea. So look with me at chapter, uh, chapter 37, verse 26. And Judah, one of the brothers, Judah says to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, these people that are traveling down to Egypt, and not lay our hands on him, and this is... I don't know if, this is, if he means this or it's just covering, but he says, after all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. Judah says, listen, we don't get any money out of this deal. It, we could sell him as a slave and make at least the, what it costs to buy a slave. And then he says, oh, and anyways, you know, he is our brother. <laughs> you know, let's not kill him. Let's sell him as a slave to a foreign country and never see him again. I don't know if it was just for the money. I don't know if there was some compassion there. 
But Joseph ends up being sold off as a slave. And as his caravan heads down towards Egypt, his homeland and his family and everything he knows and everything he loves just disappears like a speck over the horizon. And off he goes. He's not sold just once. He's sold twice into slavery. He's sold to, to, to these traders. And then when he gets to Egypt, he's sold again. Sold once, sold twice, thrown in a cistern. It's, it's, it's a painful beginning to this story. And then his brothers feel like the tracks are covered and it's the end of the story. I mean, this, this is it. It's the end of the story. I mean, we took him, we sold him, we sent him down to Egypt. Understand, in those days, there is no Skype, there is no FaceTime, there are no cell phones, there is no no communication at all. There's not even a mail system where he can send a letter to his family in Canaan from Egypt when he gets there. They know it's all over. He's as good as dead. He's gone. They take the cloak. They kill an animal. They put blood on it. They take it to their father who just weeps and is broken over his child. But what's he to think? He's dead. I mean, all 11 of my boys wouldn't lie to me, would they? And and end of story, right? But it's not the end of the story. Sometimes when we've been thrown in a cistern, been sold as a slave and sold again, sometimes when it's the darkest and most painful and difficult times of life, we feel like the story's over. Sometimes we feel like it's done. I mean, we're down in that cistern and we're looking up and we don't even see a little spot of light. We see nothing but darkness. And we see no way out and no hope. And I hope and pray over these six weeks, one of the things that God says to you is this. God is not done writing your story. God is still at work. God is still present. God is still sovereign. Your story is not over, and God is still writing it. God is still at work. God is still present. He is still on the throne. You'll get through this. It may not be easy. It may not be quick but you will not be alone. If you know God through faith in Jesus, you will never be alone. And you can always know that God is on the throne. And he's doing something. You may stand on this side of the story and look and say, there's no way out. There's no ending to this that can make any sense. But sometimes on the other side, you have a different perspective. That's what happened with Joseph. One more spoiler alert. I'm gonna take you to chapter 50. I'm gonna tell you the end of the story. And in these next six weeks, we're going to read through it three times, and you're going to kind of fill in the blanks of this entire story and hopefully see yourself in your journey, in Joseph's journey, and learn from the Word of God. But in chapter 50, what's happened now is 20 years have gone by. Joseph's been taken down to Egypt. We'll tell you the rest of the story in the coming weeks. But what ends up happening is his family ends up being brought to Egypt, and they're restored in relationship to Joseph. And Jacob, his father, is still alive, and he's reunited with his father. And, and, and Joseph cares for his brothers, the brothers that threw him in the pit, the brothers that sold him as a slave. He cares for them, but finally their father dies. And they think, now that dad is dead, now the only reason Joseph hasn't killed us at this point is because dad's still alive. But when dad dies, they are terrified he's gonna take vengeance on them for all they've done to him. And in, in chapter 50 of the book of Genesis, verses 19 to 20, they're terrified for their lives. But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Listen to this. You intended to harm me. Your intentions were bad. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. How do you go through a 20-year pit, a 20-year time of darkness, a 20-year time of slavery and abuse and come out on the other side? I mean, Joseph's on this side. He's 17 years old. And he's thrown in a pit. He's sold into slavery. And it just goes down from there. And you're going to hear the story in the coming weeks. You're going to read it in the Bible. But, But he's looking ahead and he can't see the ending. And 20 years later, he stands on the other side and he looks back. You know in a lot of those dark days when he's in jail for doing nothing wrong, when he's in slavery, he didn't see the other side of the story. But about 20 years later, he's able to look back and say, somehow, even though you meant this for bad, the God who's on the throne, the God who rules and reigns, that God meant this for good. 
And he brought me here because through Joseph being in Egypt, the entire nation of Israel was saved. And through that nation came the Messiah, Jesus Christ. God was on the throne working even when Joseph on this side couldn't see it. And God is on the throne. Whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, whatever your cistern is, whatever the slavery is, whatever the the fear and the brokenness is, God is still on the throne. And you will get through this in this life or the next. If you know Jesus, you'll make it to the other side. And someday you'll understand, but you may not for a long time. I began talking about um, the, the, the idea that, that there's, you know, when, when, we, uh, when we push through life, there's difficult times for, for extreme athletes, for runners, for triathletes, for Ironman competitors. They know what it's like to be going through the race and to hit this point where they can't push on anymore and their body shuts down. I want, I want you to watch a clip of a woman who had won this, tri, this Ironman five times. Five-time winner of this Ironman. And this time, it doesn't go as well. But I want you to watch how she presses on. Watch the screens. It does appear that Paula Newby Fraser is experiencing the triathlete's biggest fear. She's hitting the wall. Since 1986, Paula's been winning these Gatorade Ironmans, but that doesn't make them any easier or more pleasant. Mind you, this sport was never meant to be pleasant, but the reward is the great inner satisfaction felt from success. Newbie Frazier is not getting such a feeling. She's in desperate trouble. She's down. Newbie Frazier's hit a volunteer. She's totally disoriented. This is the cruel reality of the Iron Man, but she's going on. Oh, a Newbie Frazier is slowing and now stopping staggered like a boxer a tap from Smyers who goes on by meanwhile Paula Newby Frazier has the sneakers off socks too just grabbing every liquid she can in sight it's getting more frightening Paula Newby Frazier laying down in the middle of the road other finishers are running around Get an ambulance right now, 911. Who's got a cellular phone now? I think I'm gonna die. Let's get her out. Let's get her out of here. Let's get her out of here. This is going on 15 minutes of being down and out with a little delirium thrown in. No longer is Paula Newby Fraser chanting, "I think I'm going to die." She has just told everyone if they leave her alone for a moment. She might just be able to finish. Paula Newby Frazier said, give me one more drink of water and I can walk to the finish. This is totally surreal. A little bit over 20 minutes, she has shaken off the delirium, the doctors, and everyone who said, get in the ambulance and retire. And Paula Newby Frazier today proves to be the great champion she always has been. She will not be the title holder this time, but she will finish just the same. If you know Jesus, there's an end to the race. And as you're following him, it's not always easy. And there'll be times where you feel like you're running hard and things feel great. Praise the Lord for those times. Some will cross the finish line and just feel strong and refreshed and those are great moments. Some of you feel like you're laying flat on your back saying, I can't get up. But God says, press on. You Hold on to me. I'm still on the throne. Sometimes we'll walk just to get across the finish line. There'll be times where you feel like you're gonna have to get up and just crawl to get there. There'll be times when you say, I can't even get up and crawl. And then God will come by his spirit and he'll pick you up. He'll carry you forward. But if we know God and have faith in Jesus, 
we will make it through. In this life or the next, we will make it through. And it may not be quick, and it probably won't be easy. But you will never be alone if you walk with Jesus. Never. And God will always be on the throne. And sometimes that's all we can hold on to as we run the race, as we follow Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you know each person here. You know what their this is, that you'll get through this. It may be the dark cloud of depression that's just kind of come and settled over their life again and they thought it was gone and it's back. Maybe a relational brokenness that just feels so shattered like it can never be fixed. Maybe just that they're financially upside down and they just can't see a way out. Lord, it takes many shapes and forms. But God, remind us of your presence. Remind us of your strength. Remind us of the hope that we have in you. And God, when we feel strong and refreshed, may we walk with others who are in dark times. May we step into their cistern, into their deep, dark place, and love them with your strength and care for them and show them your presence. And when we are feeling like we're in the pit, may we look up and always see your face, no matter how dark it gets. God, thank you that you are on the throne. You are sovereign. You are glorious. And over these six weeks, would you speak to us through the life of Joseph? May we see our journey and our story in his. And may we be strengthened to press on. We pray this in Jesus' name. We pray this for his glory and in his power. Amen. I want to hand our venues off to their venue pastors who will share a few words with you.